John chapter 13, verses 21 through verse number 30. And the King James text today reads, When Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit, and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, by those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let's go to the Lord one more time in prayer at this moment. Father, once again, God, we come to you. Grateful for the house of God, grateful for the presence of the Lord, grateful for the songs of Zion that lift up our hearts and encourage us and inspire us and remind us, Lord, that in our loneliness, in our darkness, in our trials and travails, He abides. Hallelujah. You never leave us alone. In every struggle, in every circumstance, our God is with us. For He is Emmanuel, yes. meaning God with us. Master, the Word of God is so important to the lives and to the faith of God's people. And I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost if I'm to preach the Word of God in a manner that would allow it to be effective, in a manner of God that would allow it to go beyond merely our hearing, Lord, that would reach into our very soul and somehow affect change and inspire in us something good, something positive, something in the way of spiritual growth and advancement. Master, right now, anoint the speaker. Touch my lips. Touch the ear of every hearer. Help me, O God, to deliver the word of the Lord that you've given me from the church of the living God at this moment in time. For we ask it all in the precious, sacred name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. You know, so many Christians, first of all, let me, let me preclude my remarks today with this statement. I don't preach, I tend very seldom do I preach in the same vein that most preachers might preach on when they use a certain text. That's just the way the Lord gives me messages. So I just want to let you know in advance, if you're expecting a, a standard message on Judah's portrayal of the Lord, then you're, you're probably going to be surprised. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a different take on things in this message this afternoon. A lot of Christians make 
the enormous mistake of thinking that because someone runs in the pack, that they must be sincere, and they must be real, and they must be right with God. How many people wind up backslid? Mm -hmm. How many people wind up being turned away from God and being turned off to the faith all because of something that someone says who is part of the church, who is part of the pack, who is identified as a Christian. No one looking at the twelve apostles, the twelve disciples of Christ, no one looking at these twelve men would know that one of them was not right. Hello now. Right. No one looking at these twelve men would know that one of them had something that he loved and that he cared about far more than the Lord. You hear what I'm telling you now? Mm -hmm. I got news for you folks. Churches are full of people who love something far more than they love Jesus. You know, we look at this story in the Word of God and oftentimes we'll refer to it as Judas' betrayal of the Lord. But you know, in reality, what we're reading about in this passage is Judas' betrayal of himself. Hmm. Judas is betraying himself. He's allowing what's really in his heart to be demonstrated. He's allowing what's really in his soul to be uh, put on display. Do you know what I'm telling you now? Oh, oh, I want to tell you, there's a lot of Christians out there. There are a lot of believers sitting in churches. They cost people their salvation. They push others aside and push them out because, not because they love the Lord, because if they love the Lord, they would do more to act like Him. They would do more to live like He instructs us to live. You know, it always amuses me how we as believers have a habit of just reading the Word of God with a certain prejudice. You know, as we read certain words, we think we know what it means because we're reading it through our own lens and, and we're reading into what we're reading because we have a concept of what these words would mean. For instance, the Apostle Paul speaks of uh, different types of activities that are ungodly and that are not right. And he says in one place, let not one of these things be numbered among you. Well, now, there are entire denominations, there are entire cults, there are entire church organizations that take what Paul says and they say, aha, Paul means that we're supposed to root out all of this stuff and we're supposed to pull it out. But that is not what Paul means, not at all. Paul is speaking to the individual who is doing these things. He's not speaking to us and telling us we're supposed to root these things out and pull them out. No, no, no. What did Jesus say about the wheat and the tares? He said, let them grow up together. Am I telling the truth? He said, and when uh, it comes time for harvest, then they'll harvest it all and they'll separate the wheat from the tares and the tares will be uh, thrown in the fire. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. See, but this is what I mean about it. How carelessly we read the Word of God and how carelessly we interpret the Word of God and how we love to take a passage and try to make it say something and we never balance it against the rest of Scripture. But nothing in the Word of God stands alone. It is either supported elsewhere in the Word of God or it is clarified elsewhere in the Word of God. But... It's not the job of the church. The Apostle Paul said that it is not the job of the church for believers to sit around sitting in judgment of one another. He said that. Right, right. And yet, 
We have denominations and we have cults and we have groups and they make it their policy that if one of their members sees someone doing something that the group, that the organization doesn't believe they ought to be doing, that that member is supposed to report that then to the elders and they're then going to take that person before them and they're going to chastise them and give them an opportunity to stop doing what they're doing. No, listen folks, that is not how the church of the living God is supposed to operate. Bless God, if they don't do what we tell them to do, if they don't act right after we've called them in for our little incarceration, then we shun them. Didn't Paul talk about shunning? Didn't he say, why do you set it not your brother? Didn't he say that? Yes, he did. But do you see how easily we can take things out of context? We don't read it in the context of the whole. We only read it in context of the part. And a lot of the reason for our interpreting and understanding things according to the part, listen to me children, is because the part is saying, listen, what we want to hear. The part works for us. The whole doesn't. If we apply an understanding of this passage based on the whole of Scripture, I'm not going to like the outcome. I'm not going to like what it says. Because it doesn't satisfy my carnal thinking. It doesn't, under, it doesn't satisfy what I think how things ought to be handled. I want to tell you folks, you'd be shocked how many Christians there are in churches who go to church and they hear the Word of God preached and they hear the Word of the Lord and they participate in worship at some level and yet inside them is rancorous. Inside of them is cancerous. Inside of them is filthiness and vileness because their heart does not match their outward appearance. Judas was named among the twelve. And yet the Lord knew that Judas was set to betray him. But Judas was on line to betray the Lord for a very simple reason. Because Judas loved something more than he loved Jesus. We got believers in the church today who love political power more than they love Jesus. We've got people in the church today who love money more than they love Jesus. The Apostle Paul said he spoke of some who love more the praise of men than they do the Lord. I'll tell you, if there's anything I learned from being part of a denomination, and, and I... I'm not saying denominations are altogether a bad thing. That's not what I mean. <sighs> but I learned from being part of a denomination that most men in denominations run around and what they're really trying to do, they're not trying to please God with their preaching. They're not trying to please the Lord with their worship leading and with their song leading. No, what they're really trying to do is they're trying to secure pats on the back. They need affirmation. They need praise. They need to feel like they're part of the pack. They need to feel like others 
admire them and others appreciate them. I'm going to tell you something. For 30 years, I've been doing what I'm doing today. And for 30 years, it's been an uphill climb. If there's anything I don't get, it is adulation. If there's anything I don't get, it's praise. If there's anything I don't get, it is pats on the back. If there's anything I don't get, it is financial uh, benefit. And you know, I mean, I can get down a list a mile long of things that I don't get, that I have gotten over the years, that I have gotten in times past, that I have gotten when I was part of a denomination or a group. But I'm doing what I know God called me to do. My objective and the objective of every child of God is not supposed to be to win praise in this life, to win adulation, to win admiration. But our goal is supposed to be to make heaven, but listen to me, listen to me, it's not just about making heaven, but to hear the Lord say upon our arrival, to hear the Lord say upon our arrival, Well done, <laughs> thou good and faithful servant. Hallelujah. I think about that old song. If when you've given, if when you give the best of your service, telling the world that the Savior has come, don't be dismayed when man don't believe you. He'll understand. And he'll say, well done. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to tell you something. The most exciting words that will ever be spoken. The most wonderful musical tone that will ever touch your ear will be the words of the Lord in eternity saying, well done. Hallelujah. Oh my God, you're not just getting in by the skin of your teeth. No, you did well. Hallelujah. You did a good job. Were you perfect? No. Were you sinless? No. Were you righteous and holy in and of yourself? No. But my God, did you put forth a good effort. Mm. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Oh, I want to tell you, I love songs that speak of the Lord one day saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Have you ever noticed when we sing the song that I love to sing, I'm going that way, I'm going that way. I love that song. And, and there's one verse in that song that I mean to tell you, every time we sing it, the Holy Ghost hits me and I want to shout all over the church house. And that's the verse that talks about, I believe I'm going to uh, meet him at the gate some wonderful day. Amen. And it says, it goes on to say, I believe he'll say, well done. Hallelujah. And that verse makes me want to shout and run the aisles every time I sing it. Because that thought is what makes me get up in the morning. That thought is what makes me get in the pulpit when I don't have an audience like I'd like to have. When I don't have people that love God and people that want to worship God and want to serve God and want to build a church. People with vision. I'm disappointed in the flesh, but in the spirit, there's something that motivates me. And it is... I want to hear him say, well done. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you folks, just because somebody's in the church doesn't mean, listen to me, that they're in the church. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should rephrase that. Just because they're in the church house doesn't mean they're in the church. Or just because they're numbered among the believers doesn't mean they're a believer. No. 
oftentimes people who call themselves believers, people who are identified as believers, have something in their heart that they love far more than they love the Lord. And sadly, when the conditions are right, this thing will overtake them. This is why the Apostle Paul said, Brethren, listen to me. Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, they which are spiritual ought to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. He said, if any man be overtaken in a fault, what is a fault? A fault is an area of weakness. Listen to me carefully. It is not just an area of weakness, but it is an area of weakness that is particularly susceptible to giving way if it's shaken or if it's disturbed. In other words, if the conditions are right, this fault is going to break. It's going to happen. There are a lot of believers today that walk around and they have a fault in their life. They have something that they love more than Jesus. And the only reason they're able to just barely hang into the church to just barely go through the motions and barely go through the process of going to church and acting like a believer and acting like one who loves the Lord. The only reason they're able to do this is because nothing yet has happened to shake that fault line. The conditions have not yet presented themselves to disturb that area of weakness. You see, Judas, listen, Judas didn't betray the Lord because of persecution. He didn't betray the Lord because believers were being abused and tortured and mishandled. No. No, isn't it funny? Isn't it funny that Judas's area of weakness, his fault line was such that it wasn't persecution, it wasn't negativity that caused his fault to give way. But what was it? It was bribe, it was money. Oh, there's a lot of people in the church. You put enough money in front of their face. Honey, they'll quit going to church. They'll quit living for God. They'll quit serving the Lord. You'll never see them again. They'll be out there cussing and drinking and carousing and whoring around like nothing you've ever seen before. Hello now. All you got to do is put enough money in front of their face. There are enough believers out there Oh, my Lord, have mercy. I have a problem with preachers who go into politics. I've got a real problem with preachers who go into politics. Call me old-fashioned. Call me outdated. Call me anything you want to call me. All I know is when God called me to preach, the only job that I am authorized by Him to do for the rest of my life is preach. Bible said the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. What does that mean? That means that when God puts a call and He puts a gift in you, that He never, ever, ever takes it back. Never. So you, for the rest of your life, you're walking and you're operating under a very heavy burden. Because if you don't fulfill that calling, or if you don't use that gift right, you will answer to God in the judgment for it. You'd better believe it. Because the gifts and calling of God without repentance. I appreciate <coughs> certain TV personalities who still want to run around calling themselves reverend so-and-so. But their primary work 
is not even close to preaching the gospel. No, their primary work is politics. We have a preacher now in the Democratic Party who left ministry so he could go to the Senate. I'm sorry, honey, you're going to have to find somebody else to go to the Senate because God called me to preach. Mm -hmm. Makes me wonder if that person ever had a call to start with because I hope not. I hope not. I know figures on television who constantly appear on MSNBC trying to be nice today and not name names. Oh, you know, Rev and people talking to well Rev, well Rev, well Rev, well Rev. 99.9% .9 of everything they talk to him about has nothing to do with Jesus, has nothing to do with the gospel, has nothing to do with the work of the ministry. It's about politics, it's about activism. Am I telling the truth? My Lord, have mercy. Got news for you, folks. Just because somebody runs with the pack doesn't mean that they love the Lord like they need to love the Lord. Say, Pastor, why are you telling me this? I'm telling you this because too many believers have been hurt. Too many believers have been wounded. Too many believers have been pushed out of the church by Judas's. And when you stand before God in the judgment and you're trying to make your excuses for why you left the church, why you left fellowship with the Lord, why you backslid and went back into the world and you try to blame the Judas, the Lord's going to say, well, you know, that's funny because... There were 11 other disciples that I had. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, oh. There were 11 other disciples. And Judas' actions sent off a shockwave. Terrified them. Scared them out of their mind. They all ran like rats from a sinking ship. Even Peter denied me. Hello now. But they all found their way back. Mm -hmm. Oh, my Lord have mercy. One, one of them said, Oh, no, not after what Judas did. Oh, oh no, not after what happened, after what Judas did. I'm never going to follow the Lord again because my Lord, he set off such a shock wave. Why, oh, my, I'm telling you, I don't ever want to go through anything like that again. But we've got believers who allowed the actions of Judas to forever push them out of the church, to forever push them out of Christian fellowship, to forever push them out of the Christian faith. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Oh, children, you better be careful now. You better be careful now because that is not a legitimate defense. The Lord knew Peter would deny him. He also knew that Judas would betray him. I got news for you, honey. God knows what's in your heart. For those Christians who may happen upon this message today, and all oh, you love to sit in judgment of this old LGBT affirming preacher. You love to sit in judgment of us. I got news for you, honey. You better listen carefully to what this old preacher is telling you. You better listen real carefully. Because while you think you have God fooled, you do not. God knows where our faith lies. And if our faith is real, listen to me, it goes far deeper. It goes far deeper than the external issues that would otherwise affect us. It goes far deeper than our trials. It goes far deeper than our struggles. It goes far deeper than our tribulations. It goes deeper than our faults. 
and our failings and our sin. In Mark 14, 17 through 20, we read about Judas' betrayal. Listen, and in the evening he cometh with the twelve. And as they sat and did eat, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, One of you which eateth with me shall betray me. And they began to be sorrowful and to say unto him one by one, Is it I? And another said, Is it I? And he answered and said unto them, It is one of the twelve that dippeth with me in the dish. In Matthew we read of it. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. See, the crowd was there. The group was there. Everybody looked like they were on the same page. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful. And began every one of them to say unto the Lord, Is yes, it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto them, to him, Thou hast said. I'm going to tell you, it is amazing the games people will play. Judas knew good and well what he was up to. Judas knew good and well what he already had planned to do. Judas knew good and well that he had a, an appointment with the high priest to receive his 30 pieces of silver in exchange for betraying the Lord. Am I telling the truth? Judas knew all this. Jesus knew it. The problem is Judas was so foolish in his thinking he was so deceived that he somehow thought that he could pull the wool over the Lord's eyes. Oh, if I just talk like everybody else, if I just say the same things everybody else is saying, do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I'm going to tell you, folks, the church is full of people who say the same things everybody else is saying, who use the same vocabulary, who use the same words. But they know good and bloody well there's a different agenda working in their heart. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, I want to tell you, it goes far deeper. It goes deeper than a profession. Just because somebody professes Christianity, just because somebody goes through the motion, just because somebody acts like they're a member of the church or they're part of the faith, that does not make it so. There is little more intimate an experience than one sitting down to eat with another. When we invite someone to dine with us, we invite them to participate in a sort of intimacy. This is why dining together is so much a part of the dating or the courting experience or the mating ritual, if you will. It is during the sharing of a meal that individuals will share conversation and reveal intimate details and revelations about themselves that I tell the truth. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there are people who look like they not only know Jesus, listen to me now, but they're intimate with the Lord. There are people who look like they're not just in the church, oh, but they're deeply spiritual. They're very well established. Oh, they look like they're as close to the Lord as anybody can be. After all, there were 12 men sitting at that table eating with the Lord. And eating with someone is an intimate experience. I don't know about you, but 
There's a lot of people in this life I have no interest in sitting down and eating with. There's a lot of people in this life that I would not want sitting down at my dinner table. I wouldn't want them sharing a table with me at a restaurant. Am I telling the truth today? Why? Because having a meal is sort of a time of privacy and a time of intimacy. You only let people in uh, to eat with you that you desire to allow in to eat with you. In Revelation 3.20, the word of the Lord said, Jesus speaking, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, listen, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. See, the Lord used language that implied that he didn't want to just visit with you. He wanted to intimately interact with you. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? He didn't just want to come into your house and have a cup of coffee. He wanted to come in and sit at the dinner table with you. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, but there are people who appear. Well, they sit at the Lord's table. They're intimate with Jesus. They know Him intimately. They regularly have meals with Him. Therefore, all must be right. Everything they say must represent what the Lord would say. Wrong. Wrong. That level of intimacy, that level of closeness, don't let it betray you because it runs far deeper. It goes far deeper. True faith and a true love for the Lord and a true walk with God goes far deeper, folks. Just that surface doesn't tell you nothing. My Lord, Judas was a disciple of Christ. He had eaten with, he had traveled with, and slept with the Lord and the other 11 disciples. He had, like all of the 12, devoted himself wholly to the work of the Lord. He heard every word that the Lord taught and saw every miracle that the Lord had performed. Yet... He would go on to betray the Lord, even unto death. Huh. Just because someone has had an intimate walk with the Lord, that does not mean that their love and fidelity will fall on the side of Him who saved them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Somehow, Judas believed, despite all he had seen and heard, that he could pull the wool over the Lord's eyes. Somehow he thought that what he was about to do was not perceived or anticipated by the one who had many, many times known the thoughts of men and seen things that he could not possibly have seen in the flesh. In John 1, 43 through 50, for instance, the day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was at Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, and Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? <laughs> so you're saying I'm somebody that speaks his mind. You're saying some, I'm somebody who's honest at heart. How do, how, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip calleth thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. <laughs> Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, 
Thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Judas saw interactions like this. For the Lord was saying, I saw you, and not only could he say, I saw you, but he told him exactly where he was and what he was doing. <laughs> if he had been in somebody's house, the Lord might have said, I saw you when you were in Simon's house. But he wasn't in Simon's house. He was under a fig tree. He didn't say, I saw you under the tree. No, he said, I saw you under the fig tree. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Oh, I want to tell you today, saints, let me tell you, if you think, think you can fool God with your church act, if you think you can fool God with your walk with God posture, mm -hmm. you better think again. Judas was foolish. He was insane. He was out of his mind to think that he could pull the wool over. Is it I, Lord? Oh, come on, Judas. How foolish can you be? In Matthew 9, 1 through 5, speaking of Jesus, and he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, laying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves. In other words, they did not voice this. But they said within themselves, this man blasphemeth. Now listen, verse 4. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore, think ye evil in your hearts. For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. Oh my Lord, they were criticizing the Lord in their thinking. And yet the Lord was able to hear their thoughts. He was able to perceive what they were thinking. And yet Judas, who lived with the Lord, walked with the Lord, slept with the Lord, ate with the Lord, thought he could fool the Lord. Honey, if Judas couldn't fool the Lord, how on earth do believers today think they can fool God? But they do. And Ananias, excuse me, um... Psalm chapter 94 and verse 11. Or I'm sorry, no, Luke 11, 14 through 17. And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to pass when the devil was gone out of the dumb, of the dumb man spake, and the people wondered. But some of them said, He casteth out devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils. And others, tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. Listen. But he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and a house divided against a house falleth. Children, listen to me today. Psalm 94, 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 20. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. In 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, the Word of God declares, But the Lord saith unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. 
to any believers allowed the words or actions of false brethren to push them away from the Lord. This is a sad state of affairs, especially when you consider that not everyone who runs with the pack is sincerely committed to the Lord. They may profess Christianity, but they may not be in possession of Christ. Judas loved money more than he loved the Lord. His concerns had more to do with finances than with the work of the kingdom. Many professed Christians today are more interested in politics, power, or just plain self-righteousness or moral superiority than they are the kingdom of God. But it doesn't but if it doesn't act like a Christian, children, it's not a Christian. We cannot afford to allow ourselves to be deceived by the Judases among us. Don't lose your faith over a loser who has already lost his. My Lord have mercy. Mm -hmm. Judas' actions could have caused the eleven to ultimately abandon the Lord and discard their faith. But they didn't set their faith aside because of the turmoil caused by a traitor. Nor should you and I today. Hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26, the Apostle Paul writes, Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and today I have been in the deep. Meaning he floated around in the sea for a whole night and a day, can you imagine? In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen. By peril, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. Now listen to his last statement. In perils among false brethren. Hmm. Why in the world can we not understand that true faith and a true walk with God runs far deeper than merely what we see with our naked eye. Why can we not understand that in every number there's a good likelihood there's a Judas? Why can we not understand that the one who doesn't act like a believer is not a believer? Hello now. Just because they're professing it doesn't mean they possess it. Children, why do we let people hurt us? Why do we let people push us out? Why do we let people offend us? Whose love for God is available at a price because there's something they love more than they love the Lord. In Galatians 2 verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they may bring us into bondage. He's saying there are people who have come into the church, and their whole purpose in coming into the church was to cause trouble. I'm going to tell you, I've been part of churches in my life. I've been part of a number of churches in my life. There was the, the church I, I officially came into the apostolic movement through. I loved the pastor. I loved his wife. Loved them dearly. I've said this many times. Those of you that know me have heard me talk about this. He was the weakest pastor I've ever seen in my life. 
This man had demons sitting in his pulpit, uh, in his pews. He had members sitting in his pews who were demonic, who were literally possessed of devils. And these people would go out of their way to try to push people out of the church, to try to cause disruption, to try to cause division, to try to, and they were very successful at it. This church had more backsliders in its community than any church I've ever seen in my entire life. There were hundreds of former members of this church in the community. And it's not that they didn't believe the apostolic message, but they had been so wounded and so hurt and so offended by somebody in the church. And I mean, some of the stuff these people would do was outrageous. And there were hundreds of former members, yet this pastor would never deal with these people so that he could clean house. And if he'd have done what a pastor ought to have done, his church would have literally been, I guarantee you, probably three times the size it was. Oh, but we've got pastors. We've got believers who want to believe that everybody who acts like they're part of the eleven has to be right with God. Everybody who comes to church and puts on the show, everybody who speaks the same language and uses the same vernacular, oh, as long as they use the same vocabulary that we use in the church, then that means they're all right with God. That means their heart is right. Their walk with God is right. No, 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 no. It goes far deeper. In Romans 16 and verse 17, the Apostle Paul wrote, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. See, isn't it funny Paul didn't say root them out, date them out, disfellowship them. No, no, that's not what he said. He didn't say disfellowship them. He said, didn't say put them out of the church. He said mark them. In other words, go ahead. Like I'll tell people sometimes in the church, I'll say, honey, um, you need to be careful about hanging out with this person too much. I remember one time I was a teenager in Brother Gillum's church and there was a man in that church who was as gay as, as I am. I mean, he was just he was just a flamer, to be frank and honest. He was married, he had children, but this man was a flamer if ever you saw one. I found out years later that he was very much so, and that his wife even knew it. And I found this out. His wife told my aunt this. But one, I used to do a lot of work for Brother... Uh, Sensible, Brother Sensible would have me come over to his house and work with him to fix stuff and stuff. And he'd give me a little money. He was trying to help me, you know. And one day this man uh, from the church said something to me about, Oh, I ought to have you come over and help me at my house. And, you know, and I happened to mention to Brother Gillum one time that this man had offered this to me, you know. And Brother Gillum just said to me, well, well, well Chuck, um, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I'm not sure that's a good idea. I said, son, I don't think I'd do that. You know what I did? I knew that my pastor wouldn't have said those words if he didn't have some clue as to what he was talking about. So therefore, whenever this man would make such a suggestion, I would pass it off some kind of way. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I'll tell you, a lot of people would save themselves a lot of trouble if they listened to their pastor. Sometimes that pastor ain't trying to hurt you and he's trying to help you. He's trying to mark those that could cause you trouble. He's trying to mark those that could cause you grief. He's trying to mark those, or she's trying to mark those who might cause you to backslide or lose out with God or offend you or hurt you. He's trying to just put a little check mark on their head that says, no, you're better off avoiding them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I remember when I was getting ready to marry a young lady many years ago. 
she and her mother began to hang out with a woman in the church. And I love this woman in the church. I love her. To this day, I love her. I think she's a nice lady. I don't have any problem with her. The only problem I had with this lady is she was extremely worldly. And it was all about possessions. And it was all about keeping up with the Joneses. And it was all about, you know, making the money. She had a husband that made a lot of money. They had a beautiful home. And they had all these lovely possessions. And Stacy and her mother began to hang out with this woman. And I remember I told Stacy, I said, Honey, if you're going to be a pastor's wife, uh, you've got to understand that it's not about the money. It's not about possessions. It's not. I've had this conviction plenty going way back. So this ain't something that came to me because I've been doing ministry for nothing for all these years. No. This was my conviction 40 years ago. And I told Stacey, I said, you really shouldn't be hanging out with her. And it's not because she's a bad person, but it's because she embraces some ideas about things that if those ideas get into your head it's going to cause you a lot of hurt it's going to cause you a lot of disappointment it's going to cause our marriage a lot of trouble because ministry is not about all that for, I mean for that matter Christianity and living for the Lord aren't about all that the same things that would cause the preacher trouble would cause a lot of marriages trouble but I tried to warn her would she listen no and do you know it was that spirit that wound up being the demise of our marriage? Philippians 3, 17 through 19, almost done today. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Listen, who mind earthly things. Paul's talking about Judas's. It's talking about there are people out there, they're in the church, they're part of the number, they're part of the pack, but their heart is where it ought not to be. They mind earthly things, they're worldly, they're carnal, they're concerned about possessions, they're concerned about wealth, they're concerned about prosperity, they're concerned about position, they're concerned about the praise of men, they're concerned about things that as a child of God, if we're walking with the mind of Christ, we ought not to be concerned about those things. John chapter, uh, excuse me, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 through 5. This know also Paul writes to Timothy. That in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Listen, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. I've read to you three scriptures that deal with false brethren. I've read to you three scriptures that deal with people who are part of the pack, but they're not part of the church. People who embrace ideas and ideologies that are destructive. People who embrace practices and conduct that are divisive, that cause division and cause trouble. I'm here to tell you today, children, it goes far deeper. True faith and a true walk with God goes far deeper than merely the externals. You need to wake up. You need to grow up. You need to stop letting people hurt you that you shouldn't be allowing to hurt you because they may be the Judas. My Lord have mercy. 
In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I'll tell you what distinguishes a disciple from, of Christ from the world is that they know how to love other human beings. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people say, the Lord said you love one another. That means that y you love others in the church. No, 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 no. Here's another example of where we pull out a context and we try to interpret it out of context. Did the Lord not say, if you love them which love you, what reward of you? Even the heathens do the same. Didn't he say that? Hello now. Oh yes. Elsewhere we find, no, no, no. When the Lord said that you love one another he was speaking in terms of humanity that you love other people that you love other human beings that you're able to love your fellow man do you hear what I'm telling you now by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love not just love within the church but love for in the church as well as outside of the church do you hear what I'm telling you today Oh, children, lastly, my final passage I told you. I like to preach the Word of God. Amen. Matthew 5, 43 through 48. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. And here's what I was just talking about. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Be ye therefore perfect, meaning mature, grown, established, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Oh, it goes far deeper. Don't be fooled by the externals. Don't be fooled by the surface. Judas ran with the eleven. And everybody would have thought he was in lockstep with them. He talks like they do. He used the same vocabulary they do. When they were all asking the Lord, Is it I, Lord? He asked, Is it I, Lord? Knowing good and well knowing good and well that he had already purposed in his heart. You hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, just because somebody can sound like a Christian, just because somebody can act like a Christian, just because somebody can look like a Christian doesn't make them a Christian. No. This faith, if it's true, if it's real, if it's, if it's sincere, it runs far deeper. And I'm going to tell you, when you meet a child of God, who's real. When you meet a child of God who is sincere, and no matter what happens on the outside, no matter what happens on the external, no matter what happens at a surface level, honey, their faith is unshakable. I've always said of my grandfather, my mother's dad, bless his heart, he had a lot of struggles in life. He had a lot of I think he had mental health issues. I, had, I think he had spiritual issues. He had a lot of issues. But I'm going to tell you something about my grandpa. If ever there was a man that I believe with all my heart had faith in God, it was my grandpa. I, I, I can tell you with all sincerity today, I don't question for one second, not for one second, that man's faith. Because it goes far deeper it goes far deeper. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?